Welcome to the first Thought Talk strand of the Galway International Arts Festival Autumn Edition. This unusual version of the festival is taking place against the backdrop of the COVID-19 epidemic, which has hit arts events particularly badly. Many people have lost their livelihoods, beautiful venues like this. Uh, left um, empty for months at an end. So we're particularly glad to be able to present a varied and interesting festival, albeit truncated, smaller than it normally would be, and to embed our wonderful First Thought speakers within it. A very warm welcome to our online viewers joining us live for each of the talks. Remember, you can watch all of the talks later on the festival channels on YouTube and Facebook, or listen to them on the festival podcast series. If you're wishing to post, this is for our online viewers. Uh, during this session, please use the hashtag GIAF20. And please do post, or we're anxious that you share as much as possible. First Thought Talks are presented in partnership with NUI Galway, the festival's education partner. We have a number of moderators who have come to us from NUIG, including our moderator today. So the global pandemic has distracted everyone from the bigger problem facing the planet for which there is no vaccine, climate change, and its predictable disastrous effects on our lives. Last year, First Thought Talks hosted a fascinating and inspiring talk with four of the young people involved in the school's protest for action on climate change in conversation with the then Green Party leader, Eamon Ryan. Tar O'Neill and May Sheehan, two young Galway climate activists, will be joined again by Eamon Ryan, now Minister for Climate Action, Communications, Networks and Transport. What a change in a year. And how delightful that we were able to have them last year and can have them here again, which we said we would do. Let's see what has happened in the meantime. Well, a lot has happened in the meantime. We're going to hear what the Minister thinks about whatever progress has been made and what our two activists think about it. And we have to remember the future is in their hands, girls. You're the ones who are going to have the power in the future, not us who made a mess of everything. Our moderator will be Dr. Rory Monaghan, lecturer on energy systems engineering at NUI Galway, who is interested in clean and sustainable energy. Over to you, Rory. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katrina. And um, I'd like to thank the Galway International Arts Festival for hosting this event. I think it's um, really important that we keep our focus on the, the long-term issue of climate change. And um, so I think this is very timely that we refocus ourselves on, um, on something that matters in the long term. So I'm going to ask a couple of questions and try and stimulate some conversation between our panelists today. And um, I think what I'd like to do, because I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued to learn about what May and Tara have been doing um, over the past couple of years on their climate action. So I, th I think I'll start with a question for May and say, why does the climate matter to you? Um, well, I think the climate matters to me just like it does for every young person ever. Like, it's at the end of the day, it will be our future and our children's future, and we'll have to live with the damage that's caused by it. So I think that's why it's such a big issue for young people, just because it's something that directly will affect us. Yeah. So that's why I started to get involved in the first place. And, and why did you feel that it was, it was up to you? Um, it didn't really seem like anyone else was doing much, like, quickly. I think that's one of the biggest issues with um, climate action. Everything's kind of delayed a lot, or the goals are kind of over really long periods of time. So I think when the strikes kind of started to happen in Europe and they kind of to, started to spring up everywhere around the world, it really resonated with me because it felt like, oh, you could do something right now that would have kind of an immediate effect. Yeah. So that's why. And, 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 and Tara, so armed with this conviction, what did, what did you decide to do? I suppose I complain mostly. So like, <laughs> um, obviously getting involved in the strikes to begin with was like a massive thing. Like just seeing one of like Greta Thunberg's first speeches really, really resonated with me. So obviously getting involved in that, trying to cut down myself on like carbon emissions wherever I could, just that kind of thing, getting involved with whatever projects I, I could see. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and could, could, could you explain for, for just, just so everyone kind of understands it, what are the climate strikes? It, it's, is it an excuse to skip school? Um, a lot of people see it that way, but um, no, it's kind of a way of showing um, there's no point in having an education if we don't have a future. And, um, they're, they're really massive, like every now and then there's a global one 
or schools all around the world, people striking together, like a solidarity kind of thing, especially showing, showing solidarity with people in the global south who are already being affected by climate change. Uh, yeah, it's just <laughs> that. And, and, and to you, May, what would you like to see as the result of these, of these, uh, of, of these school strikes and your activism? Um, well, I think we've already seen results like before kind of the strike started when like environmental issues are kind of brought up They weren't really a serious thing So I think it being pushed to the forefront of everyone's mind has definitely been like a result now But I think it's kind of been like a year and a half two years since the Strikes really began so I think kind of immediate action is probably what people want like at the end of the day We're only school kids. I'm not a scientist. I can't tell you exactly what to do but uh, I think just some concrete plans with actual immediate goals is probably what we want to see right now. And, and concrete plans with immediate goals by whom? By, by, by individuals or by governments or corporations? I would say primarily governments and corporations because of course any change we make in our own lives make a difference, but um, I was researching kind of like what the impact of like COVID and lockdown has on like our emissions and it's only gone down 8%. And if you think of like air travel pretty much stopped, there was only I think half of car traffic, like there was just hardly anyone doing anything and still that was only an 8% reduction. So if our goal is 7% each year, you, that kind of shows how big of a change we have to make. Mm. And the sooner we start making those big changes, the better. Very good. Um, Tara, how, how has the reaction of the people around you been to, uh, you know, if, if they learn that you're a, a climate activist, what has, what's been their reaction? Has been supportive or have they, have they shrugged their shoulders? Uh, most of it's all been very supportive. In fact, all of it that I've experienced has all just been like, oh yeah, like good for you kind of thing. Um, like, yeah, it's all been very positive. Um, yeah. Great, great. I'll I, I bring in our, our, our minister here at this, at this point. And um, so I guess it's, uh, there was certainly, there's been an increased awareness of the environment and of climate change, and I think a lot of it is stimulated by, by student activism. Um, and this maybe contributed to some of the increase in the green vote and, and to your position in, 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 in coalition government now. Um, to what extent do you think um, you are delivering for the people um, that are, the, the, the students that helped um, get this message out? I hope I'm delivering every day, um, and we're only warming up, and it takes time, but, but um, we launched a new circular economy waste plan there on Friday, and, and that's actually, if you look at it, it's quite radical in saying we've got to consume less, we've got to be really efficient, we've got to put producer responsibility at the center of it, get them to change by design how we consume goods and, and how we reuse them and uh, reduce the amount. So. That was, that, was, that was the day before yesterday. Um, I'm spending tomorrow in Galway, but not in Galway. I'd be in Dublin, but on Zoom, a whole series of Zoom meetings, talking to activists here, talking to the Chamber of Commerce, talking to councillors, and seeing how can we translate this from the global picture down to the local. Mm. And it is exactly as May said. It's, it's a challenge beyond compare. We set a target, 7% per annum reduction, uh, having in the next decade and then eliminating effectively the decade after that climate emissions, there's never been a historic precedent for that scale of change. Um, I believe it's doable. I believe it's for the better. I believe maybe COVID has shown us, it's taken some of the, like a year ago, the climate strikes were far more prominent. The whole issue was far more center stage. Obviously, for clear reasons, COVID has taken, swept everything away in terms of but COVID at least has done three things, well, all bad, but, but three maybe things. First, it shows, as May says, that you can change. You know, we've been willing to change everything in a way to try and address this pandemic. Um, secondly, I think uh, it brought people back local. A lot of maybe time, particularly during that period when we couldn't go more than two kilometers outside of our own area, it, it, it kind of brought people back to their own area in a way. And I thought maybe that's very much central, I think, to the climate solutions is kind of thinking about local environment. And thirdly, maybe with COVID, what it did is it hastened certain changes that may help us in climate. It quickened up things that were already happening 
like the digital revolution leading to people being able to remote work rather than work all the time, having to commute all the time. And maybe we can take some of those and, and turn it to our advantage in the climate action. Mm. And, and your, I guess your, your role now as the Minister respons for Responsibility with Climate, Environment, Transport and Communications, it's a, and it's a big portfolio, but they all come together quite well uh, to address that. Um, just to return uh, for, for a moment to the waste, um, the waste Action Plan that yeah. was announced last week, um, it's, it's, it's an extremely welcome thing. Um, I guess most of our emissions are coming from sectors beyond waste, or most of our greenhouse gas emissions are coming from things like energy, from, from um, agriculture, from transport. Can the effort that was put into that waste bill be scaled up fast enough? And can we, can we motivate action among commuters and among farmers and among electricity consumers fast enough? We have to. And I think we need a new national plan, and it will take us the next year to probably develop it as to how we do it. Just on the waste one, if I can, and to pick one element of that, yep. one small element, not small, but food waste. We, we waste a million tonnes of food every year, both in the processing of food and in the use of in the consumption. Um, that's about, and sorry for all the figures here, but that's three and a half million, that accounts for three and a half million tonnes of carbon emissions. Now, our challenge is we have about 64, 65 million tonnes. So if we, were, if we just halved food waste, that maybe is one and a half or two million tonnes of carbon reduced. That's not small, as one example. Absolutely. Um, but then you do the same, and the scale, will, the, the challenge will be to go through each sector and how we move around, how we make things, how where our energy comes from, and have, for this decade, that similar ambition have it? How could we have it in each area? And how could we do it in a way that creates employment, makes a better local environment, restores biodiversity at the same time, secures our economy? That's, that's what we have to do. Mm -hmm. There was, there, there was a, a case taken earlier this summer by an organisation called Friends of the Irish Environment, and they, um, they were successful in, in, in the Supreme Court at having the 2017 National essentially climate action plan, the National Mitigation Plan quashed. What was your response to that? As a government minister, I know you weren't responsible at the time for that, but I guess as a government minister uh, in, in, in the current government, how did you react to that? I welcomed it, because I think it puts further pressure. It came from similar people to the climate strikers. Actually, a lot of it came from university, university law, law schools who actually led, and, and climate strikers who kind of led the legal case, legal challenge. I was in the court when it was being considered in, uh, in the High Court. It was one of the proudest moments I've ever had. Um, it, was, it gave me a sense of a republic that we're living in because the court was full. I mean, packed, it was a bit room like this, but the, I mean, there was literally not a square inch on the floor available. Everyone, the, every square inch was full of people, a lot of clim, clim, climate activists listening to this incredibly technical, detailed legal case. You could hear a pin drop in the court. There must have been, I mean, the judge fair play to him, he allowed this. I mean, even the barristers were climbing over people to get to the, to get to, to, to share the papers. And at that moment, I thought that this is proper justice in action. Our court's working in a good way. I was mortified because I was at the back scrunched up and at some point I had to leave to go to another meeting and I got my dead leg pins and needles so I literally almost collapsed as I tried to get out the door. <laughs> um, <laughs> fell, out the, fell out of the court. But um, I thought it was good judgment. I think uh, that was the Supreme Court appeal to, of, the, of the High Court judgment and I think it gives us further impetus to do what we have to do. And it came from, in my mind, not, every, not only, but one of the centres of that came from our universities, our legal minds mm -hmm. in, the, in mm -hmm. the universities. So the, that 2017 plan was, was, was drafted under the previous government and, and they, haven't, they haven't disappeared. They're, you're in coalition um, with Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael. Um, how can you, if there is, you know, and, and I believe the judgment said that this, that this uh, that this needs to be, that the plan needs to be completely redrafted and made far more ambitious. With that in mind and with your role as the smallest party in this coalition, how can you leverage the kind of change that's needed um, to, to write a satisfactory climate action plan? It's, it'll take a period. It'll take, we, we have to introduce legislation this autumn, a new climate action bill. 
and that will set up a, a stronger Climate Action Council that would advise the government on, on what our path is for the next 15 years. And we then will have to break it down into each sector and we will have to go to the Oireachtas, so all parties have, have a role, and it can't just belong to us, our, our party, it has to belong to, to, to each party and, and independent. And we get the Oireachtas agreement to it, and, and we, we then send that plan to Europe as, our, as part of our contribution. And the reason I say a year, it'll take that time to do it, to do, do this much more ambitious plan. But also that brings us to Glasgow. Glasgow will be the 26th time that the world has come together to call the meeting of the parties. And it's five years since the Paris Climate Agreement was signed in 2015. It's been delayed a year because of COVID. And from Greta and others, what they're saying, what she's saying, is heed the science, just go to that UNFCCC and IPCC process, look at what we have to do globally, what the science is so clear. And we have to commit collectively globally to do that in Glasgow as an update of Paris. And so if we can do our plan as part of a European contribution to that and hope that Europe works with America and China and India and other developing countries in Glasgow, that we can restore some sense of confidence that we will address this, this crisis. Trump gets re-elected. If America walks away, if China says no, what can we do? I don't know. But I think we should play our part by getting our European house in order and go go to Glasgow with, with an offer, Europe has to decide first and foremost this autumn to increase its ambition to a 55% reduction, which is what in line with what the Irish government is committing to do now. Um, sorry for the long answer to the question, but that's, that's, the, that's the timeline. That's the next year is critical, in my mind, yeah. in this historic beyond compare challenge to implement the Paris Climate Agreement. Tara, um, the minister mentioned there the, the, um, the trajectory that developing countries are on and, 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 how, and you in your answer earlier mentioned the Global South. How do you see the, the, the position of fairness in, in a response to climate change? So, so like, whereas if we consider that the climate, the damage that's been done to the climate has been done more or less by the rich world up to this, certainly up to this point, how do you see the, um, to what extent is, is fairness in, uh, in, in, what you're, in what you're asking for? Well, it's definitely there. Like, um, obviously, so far, it's been incredibly unfair. Um, there's so much going on in the global south, all these like natural disasters, et cetera. And then a lot of countries in the global south would be third, third world countries that um, kind of, like rely on other like bigger first world countries and yet we're, we're there kind of um, like what's the word like um, not really allowing any any method for them to grow apart from uh, one which involves causing climate change like we're kind of they're kept in a position some of them are where they can't do anything but contribute to climate change and then they're being affected by climate change more than we are um, and that's incredibly unfair and yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. May, do you have any thoughts on the whole fairness and, and, and equity side of? Yeah, well, I mean, climate justice is definitely like an integral part of like climate action anyways. And I mean, it is like third world countries who are like getting the brunt of the effects of climate change and they probably will be. But I think what's really important when we kind of are researching more into like green technologies that they have to be affordable for these third world countries to be able to use and implement because I think a lot of um, like envi new environmental technologies are always put in place in like the western world and really we're the ones who need them least. I think we stripped the global south of a lot of their natural resources and what they could use to make themselves like financially kind of one of the best in the world. And I, I think we almost, like climate change is a global issue, so we can't just concentrate on ourselves. They, since we took away all that kind of financial, like equities that they had, we have a responsibility to make sure that these new green technologies are affordable and that they're able to be implemented in different climates apart from ours. Mm -hmm. Like I know in Sudan, I think, 
I think in 2020, it might be a different figure now because of COVID, there were supposed to be um, 20 million deaths that are related to climate change because the temperatures have risen so much and agriculture is just like a big part of their economy like it is here. And with the soil drying out and then they don't have proper irrigation systems that, you know, it's people are starving to death and we're doing nothing about it. Do you think we can take the action necessary while still having society's current attachment to economic growth and, and this, uh, um, this, this, this kind of this traditional capitalism yeah. model? Um, I don't think so. For climate change to be resolved, our economic systems have to change. And I think we've always had a problem with like being so obsessed with like rapid economic growth, whereas we need to concentrate more on sustainable economic growth. So if we invest into more like renewable energy systems that will last for decades to come instead of like finite resources like oil and coal, that's not good for our economy in the long term. Like our economic growth needs to be concentrated on the long term and not always just the short term. But I think, I mean, one of the chants we always say at strikes is um, system change, not climate change. So I think that just shows like the economic system has to change for climate change to be solved. And what, uh, uh, what do you think about that, Tara? Do you think that, the, that, that, that our system of running economies and our system of evaluating what a successful economy is, what a wealthy economy is, do you think that needs to change as well? Oh, oh yeah, completely. Like climate change, uh, stopping climate change, it relies on stunting consumerism and stunting use of fossil fuels. And that just isn't compatible with what we currently see as like our system and economic growth. They, they just don't work together. So there's no way around it apart from changing the system. Mm -hmm. is, this, is this slightly worrying for you to hear, um, Minister Ryan, when, when, when you hear that, that the, the people that are pushing solutions for climate are saying that we need to change our economic model, just given, again, your role in a coalition. Is, it, is, this, is this something that you, in your current position, feel you're able to deliver on with climate action and system change? Yeah, it's not something I fear at all. I, I think it'll be good for us as a country and, and uh, we'll be more in tune with what's happening in, in the world. The evolution that needs to take place is a system change including economic change within that and different measures of progress and success, greater social justice, solidarity coming out of it at the same time too. Um, so no, that, I think that's, that, that's central to one of the key issues in the programme for government is, is to change the metrics of success, a new national wellbeing index rather than gross national product consumption index being your measure of success. Mm -hmm. I'd bring it back local as well though, like system change, let's start in Salt Hill. You know, let's let my mind, and I said this, so I was done, I was talking to everyone in Galway last month. I said, I'd be honest, I was really disappointed that we weren't able to put in the, Cycle the cycleway, right? I mean, I'd go, from, I'd go all the way on to, to Barna and beyond, um, but God, it starts in Salt Hill. And, and now we've done it in Dunleary in three months, and it's, it's controversial because, you know, you're diverting traffic and it's not easy and it's mm. taking space ain't easy, but. That'd be a good place to start system change. Well, I've, I've, I've seen that. Uh, I've seen the cycle lane in Blackrock Village in, in, in South Dublin, and it's, it, 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 to me, it's made a huge improvement to just the, the, the livability and the enjoyability of that, of that area. It transforms space. It yeah. transforms yeah. it. You're kind of suddenly, wow, this is a beautiful place. Yeah. And it is a beautiful place. And Salt Hill's a beautiful place. Let's make it beautiful as part of the system. And it is already beautiful, but let's... Let's, let's, let's keep Salt Hill beautiful as, a, as an American yeah, politician. Even more, say. Let's make it even more beautiful. That's what a system change. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, <laughs> more beautiful than Don, Don, Don Leary. Let's do it as a competitive thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess this isn't your first time in a ministerial role. Um, you, 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 were, you were minister with a similar portfolio, maybe without transport, a number of years ago. And it was, there's maybe some kind of sense of deja vu here that we're maybe heading into a, an economic hard times now. And when you had your role previously, there was an economic downturn and that put paid to a lot of the, a lot of the, the plans that you had then. How can you make things different this time? Well, firstly, I think we have to, the, the system change we want has to have a better outcome 
okay, you can change your economic model, you can change your, your, what you assess as success, but, but it does, we want our, our people in, in gainful, really good, high quality employment, well paid employment. We want our people healthy and, uh, and secure and uh, have a thriving country. So, so, and I, so I don't see that the, you know, that, that has to be the government's responsibility, the sole aim to try and deliver it. Sometimes in a crisis, my experience in the last one was very difficult, you could actually achieve change, sometimes more easily in a crisis than you could in another time. At that time, we set a target for 40% renewable electricity by 2020, and everyone said we were mad. You'd never, I was told by engineers, the most qualified, so you can't physically do it, it's not possible. Can never be done. It's ridiculous. You're destroying the country. You ruin the country. We're I'm sure an engineer would never have sold. They did. Would never have said and that. And you know, Rory, <laughs> this year we're going to achieve the 40. We are. Target. We are. Yeah. So yeah. my lesson from that is you can do stuff. So now we're going for next decade at 70 percent. Now it'll be the testing. You know the engineering of that. It'll be testing the outer edge of the boundary of what's physically possible. It really is ambitious. Yeah. Like big time ambitious. We're we're going to lead the world in this. We are going to be good at this. Yeah. And we are already good at it. That's why I kind of, you can look at always the dark side, black side, we're no good, we're bad. Yeah, we are in loads of different ways, particularly in climate. But we have real skills, we have real capability. And I think one of the reasons we'll do it, that type of target, there is agreement in the political system. No one disagrees. Mm -hmm. we're, we're united on that. We're also united on improving the quality of our homes, which is going to be really good for our health, to create thousands, tens of thousands of jobs. We're also agreed... It's not, it starts to get difficult when you look at transport and land use. That's where we don't have agreement, where we have to try and reach agreement. But, but the current system, in my mind, in farming and land use isn't working for the Irish people, so change is not something we should be scared of. And I would argue that the current transport system is not working, and again, we should not be afraid of change. And if anything, the COVID, what's happened with the, the remote working, gives us a chance to do it. So I, that, but what I'm saying about take back Salt Hill, it isn't just Salt Hill. I take back the entirety of Galway and I would make it safe to walk to cycle and, and cycle to school. Could we do that as a response to COVID where, I mean, I don't know what your school is like in terms of how safe is it to walk or cycle or how, how good is the, the environment around the school. But I think start with that. Mm. And I just see nothing but good coming out of that because then parents have an easier time. You don't have to be driving kids to school the whole time and people are healthier and people are more efficient and arrive in school in a, in a kind of better condition to, to, to start learning. So, yeah. so my, my inspiration is, is that in government it's tough, particularly these times, but actually sometimes in tough times you can do things. I'd start outside every school. Yeah. Can yeah. I ask a question? Yeah, of course, please, yes. Um, I know in Ireland agriculture is one of our biggest carbon emitters and transport in comparison probably is less small. Would you think it's more important to concentrate on something that is kind of easier to do, like transport and putting in cycle lanes or something that would probably make more of a difference? Like, like concentrating on our agriculture sector and maybe like encouraging solar panel farming or biofuel farming instead of beef farming? We'll have, I, I think we have to do both, such as the scale of change we need, and we need to do both straight away. Um, I think we need in farming, we need a big land use plan, mm. which, which looks not just at farming, but looks at water and flooding and biodiversity and rural development as a part of the land use plan. And I think if we address those other issues, let's just take flooding, for example. Let's look at Galway, look at Clifton last week, and look at the Owen Glen River, which kind of overflowed into the town. Well, let's take that valley and look to see, which is near enough to the National Park, you could extend the National Park south in a way, in my mind, I know the area well, and, uh, and say, what could we do to, with that valley to try and reduce the incidence of flooding, to improve biodiversity and store carbon? And you could do all three and, and create jobs at the same time. And, and that's all, you'd have to get local community buy-in, the local farmers, you have to pay them well for, for doing that. Um, but that's all for the good. I don't see that, because the, the current system, and part of that will be grazing, there'll be some grazing, so it's not like suckler farmers are bad or sheep farmers are bad, they're not, they're good people. Mm -hmm. But if we can give a signal to them, we're going to pay you as well to make sure that the biodiversity is rich and that water is stored in the river system, the river catchment, so that the town is protected. And that's a part of an integrated system. 
And more than anything else, it may be a signal to a young 20-year-old in Clifton or in that area that actually, if you, by part of doing that, there's going to be an income here for the next 40 or 50 years so that you can have, you're a frontline climate worker, you're going to be paid well for looking after this valley in a way that makes it a more interesting place to visit as well because you have a rich biodiversity ecosystem. That's all doable. Do you think the government could do those things like simultaneously though? You know, I think the Irish government's quite slow to act and I'm not sure if we're actually capable of doing, like concentrating on different sectors all at once. I think as a, it takes time, it takes two or three decades, but as a country we're small enough and connected enough to each other that once we set ourselves on a course, we can be good at it. I, and I do use the metaphor of the one, like in the late 50s, early 60s, we turned from being a really closed economy to being an open one. And we were very successful at that. It took two or three decades, but we did it by investing in education, by um, joining Europe, by setting up tax centres and so on, or industrial development centres. And because everyone agreed on it, it kind of worked over a two or three decade period. But I think similarly when it comes to climate, we need a two or three decade, two decade, we can't afford any longer, when we collectively agree, yeah, we're going to do this, and then the details of how you do it in every, every river valley or every urban, that's the local council's job. That's, that's their role to, to deliver once you agree on the broad parameters. And do I think that's possible? I do. I do. Politics matters. Local government matters to deliver it. But What's the alternative? Where's the other way of us going? Are we going to say we're going to ignore this and just opt out? I don't think that would work. No, I was just wondering if, there, if you think there's support in government for plans like paying farmers to, like for afforestation or to let wildflowers grow. Do you think there is support in the government to do that? Yeah, and in Europe too. Yeah. And that's where the money's, that's where the rules are made. So I do. I think the bigger question is, is there support in Galway for that? Like the real truth question is, because you can't force it from Europe, you can't force it from Dublin. The question is in Connemara or in Galway, East Galway, North, you know, any part, part of the county, do we want to do it locally? And if we want to do it, do it locally, then it'll happen. That's what's, I, I think that's what really is key is actually bringing back down to the local now and thinking how we apply the solutions at a local level. And that to, to a certain extent depends on people like you, I think, because you'd have the year of your local politicians, I would imagine. Mm. Tara, Tara oh, yeah. a question for you. So, so we're, we're sort of talking about the local and, and the, the bigger scale. It, have, have you, as a climate activist, ever been asked, what difference could Ireland make? What difference could my actions make? Ireland's a small country where five million people in a world of, I don't know, eight billion, possibly, people. What do you say when people, when people say that, 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 we're, that we're too small to make an impact? Well, the fact of the matter is no impact's going to be made unless everyone does their part. Like, no matter how small we are, we're still having an effect on climate change. We're still, like, quite a big one, actually. We're quite bad for climate change. Um, like, if, if we don't make a change, then nothing's really going to change. And um, really, if, if we make, like, a massive change, if we have, like, a complete system change, and we do well with it, then there's a big chance that other countries will kind of, like, follow along. So, like... The whole idea that we can be climate leaders as opposed to being kind of crap at as we are now. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yeah. And, and, and it could maybe even, we could stimulate new, new, new industries. You know, we see, I think, a, a country that a lot of people take a lot of uh, inspiration from is Denmark, that Denmark made a plan 40 years ago. They were going to become leaders in wind energy, and, and one of the biggest wind energy companies in the world is Danish now, and Denmark is a similar size country to us. So, so I, I would completely agree with you that everyone's effort counts and it doesn't matter how, how, how small a country we're born into. Um, if at the end of this talk, Minister Ryan was to offer you the chance to tell him a policy that he would enact, what would that, what would that policy be? Um, well, I think for on an Irish level, I know I've brought up agriculture before, but it is our biggest carbon emitters. But obviously, as you said, it's not farmers' fault. And I think there's a way to still have farming be a job that can support a family while also having it kind of have low carbon emissions be like a zero carbon job. And I think if there was a policy that I think Ireland could implement that would make the biggest difference, it would be 
some kind of encouragement for farmers to get into biofuel farming so their waste is actually being used for good and they, it can be used to transport anything and it will, it's a zero carbon farming. Same with solar panel farming. I know in my house my dad has been really into environmental stuff recently and we got solar panels but if we have excess energy it goes to the national grid but there's no payment received back and we're one of the only European countries that doesn't do that and I think if farmers had solar panel farming so they could produce all this energy to the national grid and then get paid for that energy I think would really incentivize farmers to go through more green routes because I think a lot of farmers want to become more environmental but it's just I think for such an agriculture uh, country we're quite behind in green farming methods so I think a policy that would encourage green farming would probably be the one I would think would make the biggest difference. Um, Eamon, it's, is, it, is it fair to say that the new renewable electricity support scheme will al allow some of, some of what May is talking about? Yes, yeah, well, yeah. Uh, but I think the key point which is, so what I get from what you're saying May is, is kind of, yeah, I go away from this story that it's farmers versus the environment. It has to be farmers with, with. and the environment with farmers. And, and I think you're absolutely right. And I think uh, there was a really good, the best solar, um, what was his name? I'm trying to remember now, a German, um, oh, sorry, it, it'll come back to me. But the best book on solar energy, Solar Century, I, um, I remember a German parliamentarian, I remember his name in a minute. But that concluded, the closing paragraphs of that was saying, actually this solar century is going to be centred around farming knowledge about how you best use land. That knowledge of Herman Shear is his name. I don't know if you ever read him, Rory. Or, and uh, he, was, he was constantly saying it's the expertise of farmers to know that bioplastics, you can do in that by the land because that, that's the characteristics of it and that area would be much better for this crop or, and, and, we, and we'll store water and wetlands there and, and, and we'll store carbon here and like 20% of our land is, is, is peatland and, and that's the best store of carbon. So actually paying farmers to find out where that is and, and this is difficult because we're changing everything for, for 50, 70 years we've been saying to them drain that land mm. and now we're saying the exact opposite. But they have the best expertise. Similarly, I think, I think we're going to an island, thinking big around climate, that we might have about 30% of our land under forestry. Storing carbon, restoring biodiversity. What kind of forestry are we, That's are we talking question. about That's the key question. It won't be monoculture, clear felling, uh, uh, short rotation, chop everything down, leaving it like the psalm every time depleting our soil and water, all that water running off really quickly into, into local rivers to run into a town. It'll have to be more continuous cover close to nature forestry. But I think farmers will be like foresters too, because I think maybe we'll have a lot of smaller pockets around farming and, uh, and forestry and ditches and hedgerows and, you know, we already have that. And we're, we're, we're actually lucky we didn't, I always remember these Danes and Dutches are so bloody good. I was there once on some trip and we were sick and tired. They were so bloody brilliant and everything. And on one train journey, someone, we were going along, all these experts and said, why come there's no trees in the, how come there's no hedgerows? And the poor Danish or Dutch engineer had to admit they made a mistake by getting rid of them. Right. For the remainder of the week, we were tut-tutting all the time, <laughs> the lack of hedgerows. <laughs> we still have our hedgerows, not, yeah. uh, build, let's build them up. Yeah. And again, that's a farming expertise. They're, they're, and um, so I, I, and I think our job in the environmental community is this. We need to ring the bell of warning. We need to uh, protest and agitate for change. But, but we need to bring allies and bring allies, I think, particularly in the farming community. And I think that, and it's not just talk. You then also have to pay people for those skills yeah. and, and educate people in those skills and maybe use this, this generation of, of farmers, particularly in the West and Northwest, suckler farmers, beef farmers, sheep farmers, they're quite old. Before they get too old, we need them to pass on their skills to the next generation of knowing how you manage the land, of knowing how you, how you could maybe redrain rather than drain a ditch. And, and, um, and we need to do that quick. And how, how, how do we start that communication? Like, it, 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 it seems that it's, it's something that we, that we could have been, or that maybe should have started long ago, but there does seem to be, now I'm not, I'm not from a, a farming background myself, but there does seem to sometimes be a, a feeling of 
that there's that there's agriculture on one side and there's there's environmentalism on the other and that that one is demonizing the other now i don't believe that's true but i there does seem to be a, a perception of that how do we how do we get over that well i think the climate strikes i mean that's maintain tower i think they got it right because what i heard when i went to visit some of these climate strikes of a friday afternoon it wasn't, it was another future, we are unstoppable, another future is possible. It wasn't all negative. It was, in a sense, at a certain message of hope. Is that fair or is that yeah. being a bit too romantic about it? But I, that's what I heard. Yeah, I think without hope, then why would we do it? I, I, I would completely agree. I think one of the most powerful climate communicators that I've heard is uh, Catherine Hayhoe, Professor Catherine Hayhoe, who's based in Texas, and she came to Galway here I think it was the week before lockdown began. It was, it was the day before lockdown began because she was supposed to speak in Belfast the following day or Dublin the following day and it was, it was shut down. But um, she said that without hope, without giving people a message of hope that we can achieve, people don't um, respond to solely negative messages. And I think we do need to keep the message of hope um, very much to the fore. And I think as well, Eamon, what you're saying is that we need to recognise the successes that Ireland has had. And, and you pointed to wind energy there. I would also point to your own cycle to work scheme. You know, it's, 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 this is something that has, these are things that have had an impact for sure. And we need to remember that and, and build on those going forward. I want to ask Tara the same question if, if you, if, if, now, I know this isn't how government works. I'm sure Eamon can't just go into work tomorrow morning and say, we're doing something like this. But if you could, if you were guaranteed one policy of yours would get enacted, what would it be? Well, like, I suppose um, alongside, obviously, implementing things like what May was saying and like new energy systems, we also need to stop doing what we're doing now. So um, like outlying ecocide, I think, would be a very valuable thing to implement, ecocide being the deliberate and systematic destruction of ecosystems. Um, and, and that this would be it would, that, that this would be a crime uh, too. Yes, okay, okay. That, that that would be a crime. Um, that was actually brought up at the the RTE Youth Assembly last year um, as a proposal. And yet, I don't think it's really been discussed enough uh, in government as something to look into. Uh, I think it would definitely be very valuable to have in, like, I suppose, a deterrent against destroying the environment. It's kind of good to have. Mm. Yeah. Ecocide, is this, is this something that's, that's, that's come, on, come on your radar? Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest, I don't, I'll have to go back and I'll come back to you, Tara, in terms of where exactly on the, do we have a legislation plan for that or what, what it says in the programme for government. But the basic premise that the destruction of biodiversity, the biodiversity crisis goes hand in hand with the climate crisis and needs to be addressed is absolutely true. That 50% of all biomass by weight invertebrate weight in the last 40 years has disappeared is is the threads are of nature we're tearing apart and that is as real a risk and as big a risk as as climate and the two have to go together um, and yes it is the destruction of the environment is a real crime i think the interesting thing around that supreme court judgment is not just in terms of what its assessment of was of the um 2017 mitigation plan but it actually opens up somewhat the possibility that people that we could see within our constitution a right to an environment which is similar in some way to the, the sort of legislation you're talking about so that i think it is that's going to be one of the ways that we that we advance mm -hmm. but i come back local as well i think i keep coming back to that like if, if loss of wildlife this ecocide is happening but what can we do it as well as legislation? I think it is back to what can we do in local environment. And again, particularly in this time after COVID, when people start to be aware of their local environment. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's, I don't know if that, Tara, may have you that sense during the lockdown. Did it bring people back local? Our sense mm -hmm. of their local environment? I think it did at home anyway. Mm -hmm. I think so. How, how has the lockdown impacted on your, your, your climate activism? Um, I think it definitely halted it because obviously a, a big part of um, climate activism is the like in-person strikes and it's kind of like the community of climate activists like say me and Tara met through climate 
kind of related stuff, so I wouldn't have seen her since lockdown, obviously. So I think there was um, like online digital strikes, so you'd like take a picture of yourself with like your sign, and there was like a hashtag and stuff. But and then obviously I was in school, so it wasn't so much at the forefront of my mind. But I think kind of coming back to school and like seeing everyone again and kind of with lockdown kind of ended, it's definitely brought climate back to the forefront of my mind, like especially I was doing research for this kind of thing. You, it's easier to forget it's such a big problem, but I think when you really research into a property, you kind of remember, oh, there's a reason why I was it's so into this at the beginning. So this has definitely like reignited my passion for it, I think. And how about you, Tara? Do you, do you, do you see now that you're returning to school, do you, do you want to return and try and get this message back up the agenda again? Yeah, abs absolutely. Like it's obviously been kind of pushed back, pushed back from the forefront of my mind during the lockdown. So it's like obviously been so much in everyone's minds because of COVID, mm. like everything all up in the air. But like now that we kind of seem like we're set on track to get back to like business, uh, business as usual, it's kind of back on mind. Wait, things shouldn't be business as usual because even though lockdowns ended, there's still another crisis on our hands. So it is definitely back to the forefront of my mind and is definitely something I want to push back to the forefront of other people's minds. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of other people's minds, I'm conscious that we've been speaking among ourselves now. So I think at, at this point, I'd like to um, offer uh, the chance to the audience to, to ask some questions. So there is, I'd ask you, if, if you have a question, would you raise your hand? Um, it's difficult for me to see. Even no questions in the room. Okay, well, so, okay, we do have a question. Yes. Oh, these are possibly questions coming from online. Hi there. Yeah, we have some questions from our online audience who are very active here across all our channels. Uh, so, a very quick question. Uh, do, how do Tara and Mai get to school? Do you walk or cycle or...? I'll go first. I go to school like in rural Galway, like near the Clare Galway border, so the roads aren't that good, so I don't cycle or walk, and then I can't get the bus because apparently I live too close to the school. And then there's 50% capacity now, so I, I, don't, I think it's less people can get the bus than usual, so I drive to school. Sorry. So, it's absolutely not on you to apologise for it's that. It's an electric car, though, so I suppose. <laughs> Maybe it cancels out. Yeah. And then for me, it kind of changes. So like sometimes I cycle, sometimes I get the bus, sometimes we get the car. It kind of changes depending on the day and the weather and the mood. <laughs> yeah. Great. And uh, a question from Catherine. Um, how can we bridge the gap between strong national policies on active transport, such as walking and cycling, and delays or challenges in local implementation of those policies? And I might just tag on to that a different question that's asking, how do we incentivize city and county councils to take action? First, can I say one of the things we have to come back to saying about not stigmatizing farmers? We shouldn't be stigmatizing each other in terms of whatever we do, whether it's in a car, whether it's a bus, you know, the, everyone has to decide what's best for their system. But the truth is in our country, we have more girls driving themselves to secondary school than cycling to school which always blows my mind in terms of you know, how have we allowed that to develop as the environment, the broad solution. We did, and just at this moment, and the reason I mentioned Dunleary and the reason I mentioned Saltain, and again, it's not to stigmatise any kind of, you know, every council has the complex decisions. But just at this moment in time, in July, we went out with this stimulus plan and we said to every council, there's 100 million here, folks, if you can spend it by Christmas, it's yours. And, and, and bid in to try and, and do it. And the lesson from Dunleary, what they, the reason they were doing, they, were doing it, they only started in Dunleary in May, and they built this incredible network along the seafront in three months. And they were able to use Section 38 of the Road Traffic Act, which means it was just, it's, and it's a test route, so it's temporary, just let's see if it works. So, so every incentive is there. And in COVID, because it's going to, you know, unfortunately, please God, it'll be sooner, but, you know, we're going to have to live with this for the next six, nine, 12 months, Lord knows. And because the public transport numbers are limited for reasons, therefore we're saying build the cycling and active travel now quickly so that we have this alternative, so that, because if everyone just ends up driving, it'll just be gridlock again. So that's why just uh, I, I focused on that one project or mentioned that because it's the money's there, the legislation will allow it to be done on a kind of temporary 
do it now and see how it works basis. And the imperative to do it is there because of the short-term COVID crisis. But the prize is that maybe if, people, if, if we did make it safe, uh, and then it would work, then, then it's brilliant. And if it's, if, if it's on the basis, it's going to lash today, I'm not going to say, and our weather forecasting system is much better. You can tell a day or two in advance what it's going to be, and we're flexible around that. Or even if we're flexible, Roy, in terms of people working, let's say, you know, I'm going to work, I'm going to work from home two or three days a week. Mm -hmm. And maybe I'll pick which days, depending on the weather, and balance things around, like using this, this new environment we're in to do it. And, and so I know I'm going to cycle to school on Wednesday, because I know it's going to be dry, to work on Wednesday, because I know it's going to be dry. And, and just, let's do it differently, because of we have the opportunity now, and, and money is not the problem. The actual restriction is political decision-making. Do we want to try this or not? And I think most people do. I, I think most people are willing to give it a go. We just need to build political consensus to, to take some risks and do things differently just in this time, but not doing the shaming thing. Because from the environment, the shaming thing, like I'm better than you because I'm cycling, yeah, okay, get over it. Um, we can all get that benefit, but doing it in a way where it's, it's easier, it's not putting a, a guilt feeling on people. I might just have a quick see if anyone, if there's any questions in the audience in our audience here in the black box. No, they're, they're all fully on board with everything so far. A couple more online, perhaps? The lady oh, online, it's probably we'll do, we'll do one online, and then we'll do this lady here. Perfect. Um, a question here, and it's probably on all of our minds. Uh, what can individuals do right now for climate change? Um, well, of course, there's things you can all do. Like um, In the past year, I've got really into like buying second-hand clothes. Oh, well, this is actually my dad's, and I, we had a sewing machine, so I hemmed it a bit. It's not the best job, but I tried. So I think, like, obviously, fast fashion's a huge contributor, so if we're not, if you can afford, obviously, to not shop in shops like pennies or kind of that cheap, poor quality clothes that won't really last a long time, I think that's a big thing you can do, personally. And then I think a lot of it, kind of depends on what you can do so obviously walking cycling where you can public transport um but of course covid affects a lot of that so i'm trying to think of other things you can do um yeah yeah and then like on top of that like like shopping as locally as you can with like food so like trying to get food that hasn't been like imported from other countries and um, like i don't know if there's like a farmer's market near you or something kind of shopping there uh, that kind of thing to try and avoid like emissions caused by food being imported from other countries and then also that's supporting local businesses as well. Just, just on both of these, I'm, I'm just going to have a very brief question for Eamon, on both of these which are about kind of personal actions that people can take, how can, how can people be nudged to make the right decision on these, or maybe, okay, maybe not the right decision, I don't want to get into the stigmatisation, but how can people be made to make the decision that's beneficial for the environment, like on the fashion? For, for, for example. This is really tricky, and I have to clear, I stole this from my son this morning. So I think that... <laughs> I think I'm unfortunately wearing all my clothes stealing back today. from children is, <laughs> it's very much part of it. Can I just take that as an example? Because we launched this waste plan on Friday, and the reason why I say you've got to get away from this whole shaming or kind of make people feel guilty. So we launched it, there's 200 actions in it. It's like transformative across those ways. The Irish Times ran with the story, it's all about making fast fashion expensive and, and stopping and putting levies on. And Two for thinking, once. <laughs> lads, that was not exactly our first priority here. Yeah. That was probably 194th of the 200, but it was front page news because these people are going to make you pay. These people are going to make it, you're a bad person by going into whatever shop. I'm not going to mention any shop. You know, I just think years ago, Years ago, we did a scheme called No Logo, a project where we were asking, how could, you, how could we affect how we buy clothes? And it was really interesting. And we got students, 16, 17 year olds, to do a competition. Could you get an outfit for uh, either stealing from your sibling or son or daughter or charity shop or whatever for less than, I think it was 15 pounds at the time. And it was really interesting learning. And one of the things I learned it from is, is um, well, Firstly, a lot of people in front of 16 and 17, they're very intelligent when they're buying things, you know, and they're making a statement, and let people be free to make whatever statement. Don't, don't let's stigmatize, because that's really difficult. But what you can do, maybe, what I think, if I had first priority on clothes, currently only 1% 
of fabrics, textiles are recycled, recyclable into other textiles. A lot of it's recycled and maybe turned into, because they're plastic, turned into some other plastic item. But actually textiles being recycled into textile, only 1% globally. So could we, by design, say to the textile manufacturers, say to, can we have textiles that are actually recyclable so that you can turn it into other textiles? And that's not easy. But that by design solution, rather than putting all the emphasis on the end use consumer, that Bill McKibben and Amy Klein and the environmental movement have changed course in the last four or five years, and Greta is part of this too that recognizing the system change here is it's not all about the consumer. You start at the start of the pipeline. You start at the source. You start at how you make textiles. You start at the coal mine. You start at the gas field. That's why we have got political agreement here across all parties that we stop expiration. We stop fracking. We stop peat extraction. We stop at the source. And I think that's the same in so many different areas. So you say to manufacturers and to retailers, we want you to be part of the solution. We stop you at source of doing unsustainable things rather than putting all the pressure on the 16-year-old to think, are you doing the right thing, yes or no, one way or the other? Make it easy for people to do the right thing is how we need to change. Exactly. Yeah. The Irish Times could have written that on Friday. Um, there's a lady here in the white who had a question. Just wait. Just, sorry, there's just a microphone on its way to you there. Thank you very much to, to May and Tara for being courageous enough to come and sit up on the stage at a talk like this. You're really inspiring and keep up your good work now that you're back in that sphere again. A question for yourselves. What is it like for you to hear the minister who's a few decades ahead of you speaking about two decades and three decades when you're still at school? You referred to that earlier on, May. I wonder, is that frustrating for you or do you feel you just have to accept it? And a question for the minister. Um, how deeply embedded uh, in, in, I suppose, national policy is the kind of thing you've been espousing? And if there were to be a change of government, how much would we lose? Thank you. Okay. So, first question, then, I guess, we'll go to Tara first this time, maybe, um, about how do you think, you know, when we talk about cutting emissions in half in a decade and, and further cuts to zero in two decades, does this talk, it was about the time scales, right? Does this, does this sort of get you down or, or what do you think about these time scales? Yeah, like when I hear the kind of idea of, oh yeah, in the next like two, three decades, it's quite jarring, like kind of stop for a second, like hang on, that doesn't sound right because really we should be moving as quickly as is possible. And obviously it's difficult to go any faster than that, but I can't help but think, can we not try a little bit harder? That's kind of on, on my mind when I hear two, three decades. How about you, May? Well, I think of, like, with COVID, how quickly we've changed for that. Like, it's only really been six months, and that was a huge change. So I think, of course, like, we have no experience in, like, government making policy. So maybe our um, thinking of how long it will take. But I think in two or three decades, like, I'd prob like I'd be 37, 40, no, oh, yeah, no, 47, 57. So I'd probably have my own kids by then. So I think to hear that, you know, these goals will only be reached when we're parents or we're adults is, of course, a bit frustrating because, I mean, like, estimates of how soon we'll feel the effects is, like, anywhere between, like, 11, 12 years at the earliest. So I feel like we need to move rapidly, and I think we can, and I think COVID's shown that we can change rapidly if there's a push behind it. Yeah, I would just say before before passing on to Eamon to, to answer the second question, I would just say that I think you, I think whether you know it or not, I think you do have experience in in setting policy because I, I really think that uh, uh, the the actions that you and your your classmates have taken all around the world has helped get people like Eamon elected <laughs> and this time. You know, I know Eamon was elected before, but but I think it's it's there is there's been a resurgence in public awareness and I think a lot of that has come from the work that, that people like you and Tara have been doing on the streets so uh, I would say you're, you're, you're at the start of that pipeline I think when it comes to policy. Um, Eamon, this, the, second, the second question there was on um, how much do you think if there was an election how much of your and I assume if Eamon wasn't re-elected or if the Greens weren't in government again how yeah, how much of, of your agenda on the environment and on climate would survive? I don't know. Um, 
not as much as I think if we are there, because we are a party which is focused on this ecological crisis as our driving motivation and an understanding that it needs to deliver the system change and social justice and so on that, that, that comes with that system change. I think there are other people in other parties think that too, but they're probably in a minority. And I'll be honest, we sat down with all the parties after the election in talking, talks for Programme for Government, and, and I don't think, I don't think, I think we would be missed if we weren't there, I'll be honest. And I think, um, but that's why I'm in politics, and that's why I want us to go into government, because I do think that, yeah, I think we are focused on it. And, but I think everyone, that'll broaden, and it needs to, and it can't, as I said earlier on, it can't just belong to us, because if that's, the case, then we'll have to get a majority and we'd have to be a single party government. And that probably might take a while. Mm -hmm. So, so, and I think one of the first things you do is you work with all other parties. Just as I said, you don't stigmatize other sections of society. I think my gender, I, I think the sense of politics that works here, the climate politics that works, is, is to get involved. And can I say lastly, you said who's a good communicator. I for the first time went to see Greta, and I mention her because she inspired the climate strike movement, I think, and I had the great privilege of seeing her in Madrid at COP25. And my God, she was a bloody good communicator. She seems to have a nearing ability to piss off 57-year-old men like me around the place. <laughs> but I thought her message was so clear, and what it was brilliant about it is that it was a succinct combination of absolute alarm, the place is on fire, what are you doing about it? And at the same time, there was a message of hope, and her hope in the message she gave in Madrid was politics, democracy matters. Politics and democracy is the solution. Politics and democracy is where you have to focus your effort of change, and not seeing democracy as the source of all ills, but the source of hope. That's what I heard her say in Madrid, if you look at her speech in that conference. And my God, she was brilliant, I thought. I think we... I I'll see if there's one more question in the audience here. None of the audience will go to another question online, maybe. Well, actually, just to follow on from Eamon's question, one of the, the questions is that how do the, the young panellists feel about the work that is being done by Greta, if you'd like to kind of add to that? Well, I think we all admire Greta. Like, it was, I think it's the same with a lot of young climate activists when she spoke at the UN Climate Summit in late 2018, I think. I think that inspired a lot of the strikes across Europe. I mean, like she kind of did start like that kind of school strike for climate thing. So, I mean, I don't want to speak for Tara, but we both admire her, obviously. Yeah, like definitely. Like I think she kind of, she was what got climate started talking about, got people to start talking about climate again. Like I wasn't aware of how urgent it was until I saw like one of her first speeches. Like I, she's really kind of got it back on the map, back as something being talked about. Um, yeah, she's, she's great. <laughs> Brilliant. I'm going to, I see, is there a gentleman with a question over here? We'll try and get this. We're a small bit over time, but I think there's some good questions starting I think it's to come in. Yellow in there. at the corner. Yeah, yeah, man in the corner here. And is there anyone else in the audience who has a question after? If not, then we'll maybe go online and see if there's uh, one more there. Just for Minister Eamon Ryan, uh, did you face much, much opposition to that waste scheme from, let's say, the bin companies? Or? No, to be honest, I don't think that was the one where, where we have difficulty, because I think it makes such economic sense, and, and there's, a, there's a broader consensus on that than in other areas. The reason, as I said, where I'm facing probably the biggest challenge is around transport and land use and agriculture, and, and, uh, but on, on waste, it's... Sorry, there was a lot of opposition from the industry initially. We were like fighting for some of the, you know, some of the examples, like deposit refund scheme. I mean, God, yeah, we were fighting for two or three years on that, and including politically fighting, it wasn't, it wasn't easy to get it. But once, once we're in government, I found the, you know, that, that was something we were able to agree. I'm, we have to deliver it now. I'm actually comforted to hear that there was a fight, because my, my initial thought was, if there was no fight, why didn't someone else do this before? Because a lot of it seems like common sense, but I guess there were companies preserving their their model, you know, that, sure that, 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 needed to be, that needed to be persuaded. Is, is there maybe time for one more question online? 
couple of more, yeah. and I might just clarify that earlier question that came about whether Tara and May walk or cycle to school. The question was asked because the, the person said that Galway can be kind of a contrary, sort of hostile city for young people to choose active travel. So that was where that question was coming from. And a question for Eamon. Um, are there measures to improve our buildings coming down the tracks, you know, for example, retrofit uh, grants for houses and office space, etc.? Yeah, this is of all the big projects I said earlier on, retrofitting houses is the one that there's widespread agreement on it. There's agreement we, we have two million houses. For a wet, cold country, they're, what were we doing building them with breeze blocks and kind of without proper insulation? We have to change all of them, and, and not only will it be that a climate benefit, but also there'll be huge health benefit. And, and basically, we have to stop burning fossil fuels. So we have a million oil-fired central heating systems that all have to go. We have to stop. No new house should have a, any fossil fuel heating, for, you know, gas or oil system. Um, and there is alternatives now. These new heat pumps really work. And, and, and the potential benefit of it is, is that with the electric car in the front and the heat pump at the back of the house, and with all this wind power we're going to develop, you'll get this balancing system where you can turn on all the heat pumps when the wind is strong and then turn them off when there's no wind. So you're, you're balancing all this renewable power supply and same with your electric vehicle. And actually this will really work in rural Ireland because there it's easier to plug in a, an electric vehicle compared to maybe if you're a terrace row in, in, in a city. So, so, so this whole project of going into every one of those houses uh, putting insulation on, putting solar panel on the roof, putting a heat pump at the back and a car, electric car charging point in the front is a 50 billion euro project that will create 30,000 jobs that we have to do over the next 20 years. There's widespread political agreement on it. It's, it the challenge now is to make it easy so that you don't have to have a PhD in engineering, physics, building physics to, to do it. So you have easy financing and, and the builders come and do it relatively quickly in an in and out job and, and that's that's no small task we're, we're probably doing about one or two thousand houses a year at the moment we need to go up to at least fifty thousand in the next four or five years and 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 we'll do it because it makes for a better healthier warmer home the difficult thing is you can't see it like people spend a lot of money on things that you can see but the definition of insulation is it's hidden so we need to we need to get public support behind this as a, as a clever investment, and, and that's going to happen. Okay. Well, we're, I'm just going to start wrapping up now, but I might just offer a chance for Tara and May to offer their any final thoughts of one final message that you'd like the audience in the room here and the audience online to, uh, to take away from, from you. So maybe Tara first and then May. I like, I suppose, it, it's very easy to feel hopeless when looking at the climate crisis and looking at like the promises of like two, three decades and all that kind of thing. And, it, and like it can be easy to just kind of fall into that and just feel, feel sad. But um, like everyone can make a difference, even just doing small things in your community, doing just like beach cleanups, uh, recycling, shopping locally, all that kind of thing. Both, it, helps contribute to um, the, the fight against climate change and it also helps your mental state a lot. It can be very helpful for just feeling more safe and knowing that you are doing something to help. So I'd recommend that anyway. Great. Um, well, obviously I agree with everything Cara says. I think it does start locally and like personally with what you can do. But I think also like politics is a huge part of how we can solve the climate crisis. So I think definitely like talking to your local TDs or councillors could make a big difference. And I think also if any of your kids want to join the strikes, it's always open for more people. And I think the more people that do it is like the best because really to solve this, we all need to come together like no matter what age group you fit into or what kind of category of society you belong to but I think it's really important that we all work together despite um, the different areas that we're put in so I would, encur I would encourage you to come to the strikes as well if you want to. Yeah, yeah. I've been to them I can, con yes. I can confirm that they are a brilliant atmosphere. Yeah it really inspires you I think yeah. when you're at them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, with, with that I'd like, to, I'd like to thank our panellists uh, May Sheehan, Tara O'Neill, Eamon Ryan and um, thank our audience here in the Black Box in Galway and our audience viewing online. Um, I've certainly found it really enlightening to hear from your three perspectives so and, uh, I hope 
everyone else did. So can we um, just get a round of applause, please, for our, for our panellists. Well done, girls. The future is in safe hands, and we look forward to uh, your progress in the future. It's been a, a lovely session this afternoon. I think it is a moment of hope when we have a Green Minister in the most significant ministry to do with climate change and its, its related um, systems. And one of the discussions we're going to be having actually next is me talking to Fintan O'Toole about what sorts of changes may result from the pandemic. It has exposed all kinds of fractures in our society, including in health, transport, housing, all kinds of areas that we talk about, not least uh, progress in climate um, change. So you're welcome to join us again uh, online at 6.30 this evening to uh, join in that discussion. Thank you for being such a wonderful audience, both personally and online. Uh, and thank you for coming today. <laughs>